Welcome back. So this is our second uh, foreign investment video now. Uh, and we left off with the Lucas paradox, right? With this idea that a real simple economic model, you know, sort of a factor, factor of production model is going to say where capital is abundant, we should have cross-border flows away from capital abundant states toward capital scarce states, right? Where, we can, where investors would, inspect, would expect a higher return on their capital, right? So they'll take it from a place with abundant capital and low interest rates to a place with uh, scarce capital and, and higher interest rates, right? A higher price for their capital. Um, but instead we see the reverse, right? And we, we sort of uh, foreshadowed the idea that this is due to politics, this is due to risk, right? So let's talk about political risk. Let's talk about um, the risk premium that exists uh, in most developing countries relative to sort of rich, richer developed states. Um, all right, so let's talk about, you know, when we talk about political risk, kind of the archetypal way uh, that investors lose out uh, due to political risk is that the government just takes your stuff, right? The government says, okay, you, you made this investment, that's all fine and good, but you know what? That factory or that mine, that belongs to us now. Um, so we'll talk about sort of this idea of an implicit bargain. Um, sometimes it's explicit, but there's at least an implicit bargain between the state and a foreign investor when somebody brings their capital into uh, a foreign country, right? Um, and so in that, that implicit contract sort of says, okay, the investor is promising to bring in some capital and to follow local laws and to pay their taxes. And the government is saying, well, these are the laws I'm going to put in place. They're not going to be any more stringent than this. And this is the level of taxes I'm going to put in place. I'm not going to take any more than this, right? So they're both making promises about how they'll behave after the firm comes in. Uh, at the time when that bargain is struck, the investor is pretty powerful because they can go anywhere they want, right? So, okay. So if I'm going to come in and build a copper mine, I can't build that just anywhere. It has to be somewhere that has some, some copper uh, sitting underneath the ground that I can go dig out. Um, but I've got a variety of different countries I could go to to do that, right? And I have the option of being like, you know what, instead of building a copper mine, I'm going to take this capital and do something else with it altogether, right? So I still, I still have options of what to do with my capital. Um, so the government offers me pretty attractive terms to, if I'm a mining company to get me to come in and build this mine because the, cap, the government, you know, they're, in a, they're a capital scarce country. They want investment to come in. They want job growth. They want tax revenue, right? Okay, so they say, oh, you know, we won't charge you a very high tax rate. Maybe we'll have fairly lax uh, labor laws that allow you to pay pretty low wages to your workers and don't require you to invest in a lot of safety equipment, um, that sort of thing, right? So in that first year, there's sort of this implicit bargain or with maybe some explicit parts of it, like things that are actually written down. Uh, and then the firm comes in and does all this investment. They dig the giant pit in the ground. They put in place all the expensive machinery. Uh, maybe they build a road from the mine to the port so they can ship the minerals out of there, right? So they spend a lot of time sinking capital in. And once that capital is sunk, right, now they're no longer, now they can't go build a mine in some other country instead, right? This, this is the mine they've got. That capital's stuck. Uh, so due to that, the, the bargaining power has really shifted now. Now the government is much more powerful relative to the foreign investor. And so they have the ability to renegotiate this contract, right? And the most extreme form of renegotiation is to just take the mine altogether, just say, that's ours now. You know, this is now uh, a government owned mine. Um, but they can renegotiate in more subtle ways as well. They can put in place now uh, stricter labor standards, stricter environmental standards, they can raise taxes, right? So they can renegotiate uh, the bargain in all sorts of ways. Um, and this whole concept of a obsolescing bargain, it's one of a couple actually uh, social science concepts that we'll hit in this lecture that are much broader than political risk, right? So I wanna give you at least one other example of obsolescing bargains to sort of show how this concept travels across uh, different domains. Um, let's take the concept of a civil war. Let's take the, the problem of a civil war. And you've got, let's say you've got a, gubble, uh, a rebel group that's challenging the government. You've got some government forces. They've been fighting for a while. They kind of reached a stalemate. They're at the bargaining table. And in order to resolve the civil war, the government makes an offer to the rebels. And they say, okay, we're going to give 
uh, some regional autonomy here and let there be a lot of like kind of local governance here. Maybe we're going to appoint some of the leaders of your rebel group into the government. We're going to promise kind of this, that, and the other thing. We'll promise that we're going to go build a bunch of roads in this area, whatever the, the, the promises are, right? But maybe one of the demands from the government is that the rebels disarm, right? That as part of this settlement, um, you put down your guns, right? The problem with that being part of the settlement is that it leads to an obsolescing bargain. As soon as the rebels put down their guns, their bargaining position becomes much weaker. Just as in, as soon as the, the mining company actually builds the mine, their bargaining position is much weaker. Now the government um, you know, is like, well, if we go back to war, now we're gonna win. They don't have their guns anymore, right? So the government doesn't have to make all these concessions anymore. And so they kick the former rebel leaders out of the government they pull back the authority that they were going to decentralize to that regional government, right? Um, and we see this sort of obsolescing bargain happen all the time. And, you know, and Barb, Barb Walter is uh, one of the scholars who sort of did a lot of this work uh, in the late 90s vis-a-vis -vis civil wars. Um, but so this, this concept of obsolescing bargains is, is, you can think of a lot of contexts where the nature of the deal that we reach affects what the future bargaining leverage of each party is. And that can make uh, a bargain hard to enforce over time. All right. That sort of outright expropriation of kind of, okay, you came in here, you built your mine, uh, now we take it. Um, now the government just takes it from you. That's sort of fallen out of style. And, and part of this is that one of the ways you deal with an obsessing bargain is you get a third party to enforce it. Right, so the bargain is no, after the power dynamic shifts, the bargain is no longer self-enforcing, right? It's no longer in the interest of the government to respect that bargain. But maybe you've empowered a third party to enforce that bargain. And that's what's done by bilateral investment treaties and the investment provisions and preferential trade agreements. Um, they, empower, uh, they empower third party uh, arbitrators to enforce uh, claims against uh, governments. Um, but it's also the case that besides sort of these formal kind of treaty-based enforcements of, of, these, of these deals, it's also the case that when the government comes and expropriates uh, uh, a mine or a factory or something like that, that there are reputational costs. The other investors see that action and they say, oh, that government doesn't respect property rights. We're not going to go invest there. And so it makes it much harder for that country to attract more capital in the future, right? So sort of the archetypal nationalizations um, really occurred, uh, you know, sort of what people kind of have in mind when they talk about these nationalizations. A lot of this is sort of left, leftist governments coming to power in Latin America in the 60s through the 80s uh, and nationalizing uh, foreign investments that were made under more right-wing governments. And now when we talked about, and some, some of this happened in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and, and in different parts of Asia as well. Uh, now, just because an expropriation is a violation of the rule of law uh, doesn't mean that it's not in some sense morally or normatively justified, right? So we talked about neocolonialism. We talked about the nature of deals that can be struck between multinational, government, uh, multinational firms and governments. And if you look at things like, uh, you know, like the United Brands case in Honduras where the United Brands company literally just paid a $50,000 bribe uh, to the Honduran president, right, to, to get a sweetheart deal, right? So like this straight up just quid pro quo cash corruption kind of stuff that goes on. Um, wait, was it 50,000? It might've been considerably, maybe it was 500,000. Uh, I'm getting the amount wrong, but I think it might've been. Anyway, there's quite a lot of cor corruption that goes on in uh, establishing these deals between multinational governments, uh, between multinational firms and governments. And so sometimes if you've got, let's say you've got a dictator in power, who's signing all these sweetheart deals for multinationals, enriching his or her family, right? Usually his family. Uh, and, and all that money's, you know, ending up in uh, real estate on the French Riviera and this kind of thing. Um, and then you get a new government in power and the new government says, no, we're not gonna respect this contract you wrote with this dictator where you, uh, you know, paid him a bunch of bribes and then signed this contract that is in your interest and not in the interest of this country. Of course, we're gonna repudiate that contract. Right, um, and so the foreign investor is going to scream, "Breach of rule of law! Breach of rule of law!" But maybe this is pretty justified, right? So, uh, so I just sort of want to add that angle to kind of how we think about uh, expropriation when it does occur. 
um, what are the conditions under which that initial contract or implicit agreement was reached? Uh, and then, you know, what are the justifications for that breach of contract? Okay. In the context of these treaty-based sort of agreements, uh, countries will have to pay damages if they are found to have violated the terms of the treaty. So a firm, a private actor, can bring a government to this body uh, and the body may find that the government has violated their treaty and will order the government to pay money to the firm. Um, and if the, if the government doesn't pay money to the firm, right, yes, they're a sovereign nation, uh, but these enforcement bodies, right, are tied to the IMF and tied to the World Bank and this sort of thing. And what you can do is you can lose, if you're a government, you can lose access to international credit. And there's a lot of ways um, for these international bodies to kind of turn the screws uh, and force the governments to, to, pay, uh, to pay these damages. Um, okay. So, and we and notice when we talked about like the USMCA, uh, this, this agreement with Mexico and Canada that was recently reached, it had weaker uh, arbitration clause in the, in the USMCA than had been present in NAFTA, right? So trying to decide like, okay, it's great to have this enforcement mechanism in that it helps get more capital into countries, it helps investors feel safe. Uh, so it reduces political risk, allows more foreign investment to occur. But it's also like it, it messes with sovereignty, right? It makes these uh, governments accountable to firms, to, to multinational firms. And you can have a democratic government being forced to pay uh, damages to some big multinational, even if the citizens don't want to pay those damages and don't think the government did anything wrong, right? So it definitely messes with sovereignty. Um, so it both facilitates investment and undermines sovereignty. And it's a, it's a tough thing to, to weigh, I think. All right, so that's outright expropriation. It's, law, it's largely kind of, it doesn't occur a great deal anymore. What you get instead um, when governments want to kind of renegotiate a contract or when governments want to expropriate wealth from multinational firms, you get various flavors of creeping expropriation are much more common now. So this is just sort of like piecemeal expropriation. So you might be raising taxes or you might be making regulations more stringent uh, in ways that reduce the value of a firm's invested assets, right? Um, so super broad category uh, includes one type of risk that I'm particularly interested in, which we call transfer risk. Um, and, you know, there's different ways to split out these types of creeping expropriation. Um, and some of the ways I break it out in my research is to look at policy risk, bureaucratic risk, and risk of political violence as kind of three different, three different categories. And so let me, let me run through that breakdown for you as we sort of think about what are the different ways uh, that the nature of the way a country is governed uh, induces risks uh, for the foreign firms that, that invest there, right? So policy risk is sort of this risk of adverse policy change at the national level. So a risk that the national government is gonna change policy, change taxes or change regulations in a way that, uh, that harms your firm. And now if the government does this in a way that targets a single individual firm, that will often violate you know, a bilateral investment treaty or a preferential trade agreement, right? And will sort of lead to this international arbitration. But if the government raises tax rates across the board, or increases environmental regulations across the board, right? That's generally speaking, not gonna violate those treaties, right? That's sort of, that's the policy discretion that a government has, right? They're allowed to change policy and tax rates over time, right? Um, they're just not allowed to target uh, individual firms. Um, but the countries where this sort of thing happens, um, you're gonna get more policy change, more frequent policy change in places with unconstrained executives. So we actually have this, a lot of discussion in the US right now about gridlock. Right, about this idea that we have too much polarization, too many veto players in our system, and that we can't actually change policy hardly at all, even when we want to, right? That we, right now, you know, we're in the middle of COVID and we cannot pass a bailout bill because the two parties can't agree on how big that bill should be, right? And so we haven't managed to pass anything at all this fall. All right, um, but in general, the fewer veto players you have, right? The fewer players who can intervene and block a policy change, uh, then the more, uh, unstable your policy is. It means your policy can be more responsive. You can turn on a dime, right? But that's also risky for firms. Uh, you're trying to make this long-term investment and there's this risk the policy is gonna change on a dime, right? And that suddenly environmental regulations are gonna get much more strict or tax rates are gonna go up a lot. Things that might take what used to be a profitable investment and turn it into an unprofitable investment. Okay, so just like the obsolescing bargain, veto players is one of these concepts that uh, that is, has, has a really wide application, right? Um, so a veto player is anybody who can, who can 
block or veto a change to the status quo. Um, and if you've got more veto players in the system, you're going to have a more stable status quo. Well, there's lots of institutions you might be involved in designing, whether it's the leadership of a Greek organization or a student club, or whether it's the uh, leadership structure of the uh, startup uh, firm that you launch after graduation, right? Um, if you have, if your startup has very few veto players at the top, if you have a single CEO who is, uh, has complete power and, and control over the organization, you can be very nimble. But also, you're going to be prone to big swings in policy, right? Um, and so, you know, this is, do you want a board of directors with six people, each of whom can veto a change, or any two of whom can veto a change? Or do you want like that single leader, right? And so you're choosing between responsiveness and stability, right, um, in the institutional structure. Um, in terms of looking at places to invest, firms really like stability and predictability. They want to think that like, hey, the policy environment that's in place now is going to be the one I'm operating under for quite a while, right? You can't make long-term investment if you have no idea what policy is going to be like in a year or two. So firms tend to like systems with more veto players, with an independent judiciary that can declare uh, actions by the executive or the Congress unconstitutional, that has not just an executive like a president or a dictator, but also a legislature, or maybe even two houses of the legislature, right, that can both be veto players. Okay. So that's sort of this policy risk, the risk that the laws on the books might change suddenly. But you also have risks imposed by bureaucrats and, and local officials, right? And this is a lot of like corruption stuff, maybe inefficient civil courts, like the fact that, hey, uh, this other firm was supposed to deliver you some goods, uh, you paid them, and then the delivery never came. Can you get your money back from them, right? You take them to court. Uh, how expensive is that to do? How long does that take, right? Okay, you just uh, ordered a whole shipment of goods from overseas, a bunch of inputs are coming in, but they get hung up at customs, right? You can't even get it through customs. Um, that sort of thing. You're trying to build a new headquarters and you can't, uh, there's so much red tape, you can't get the construction permits. Um, it's all these sorts of things, right? Um, can make uh, things a lot more difficult to do business. Um, but this is really about what's going on with bureaucrats and not, and not the, the policy on the books, right? So bureaucratic risk tends to be high uh, when government capacity is pretty low, right? When you don't have a bunch of highly skilled, well-paid uh, bureaucrats, right? So you know, we talked about the British civil service, right? If you've got an efficient civil service, a well-trained civil service, um, you know, uh, these things are going to go uh, a lot better. And then lastly, you've got this risk of political violence, right? The war is not good for business by and large, right? Um, and nor are sort of uh, terrorist attacks or riots or, or any sorts of political violence, right? So, um, you know, whether it's interstate wars, so two countries fighting each other, civil war, what, government violations of human rights, right? Really not good for business if, if your workers are getting arrested and, and thrown in jail for no reason, right? Okay. Um, yeah, so this one's pretty straightforward, but we, you know, foreign investors are going to be hesitant to invest in places that they think uh, might go to war soon, right? Um, you know, if you look at uh, the expansion of NATO into Eastern Europe, uh, you know, Russia does a lot of things to uh, destabilize the countries on its periphery, whether that's uh, Georgia or whether, um, you know, whether that's the Ukraine, right? Um, but once, but some of Eastern Europe, right, got underneath the NATO umbrella, uh, and that has helped limit uh, the extent of Russian kind of military interference, make uh, investments in those countries more secure, right? Um, so, so this interstate security is a big, big piece of this. Um, all right, um, I wanna talk about transfer risk as kind of a particularly interesting category uh, of political risk. Um, and this is sort of risks associated with trying to repatriate your profits. Um, so this has a lot to do with like capital controls, exchange rate volatility, right? So if I invest in Mexico and I'm earning, all of my earnings from, from selling goods in Mexico are in pesos, in order to uh, kind of bring that those profits back to headquarters and maybe use it to repay debt or other things. But I've got to convert those pesos into dollars uh, and bring them back across the border. And often uh, governments will put in place uh, uh, capital controls that prevent capital from flowing back out. And as we get into the finance chapter, our uh, sort of module, 
uh, in the course, we'll talk about why sometimes that's just prudent macroeconomic management for a government to limit how quickly uh, capital can flow back out of their country. We talked about the risks associated with hot capital. Um, we'll be talking about um, why governments might uh, put limitations on capital outflows in times of crisis. Um, but they also can use those uh, restrictions on capital outflows as a way to essentially tax the money that's coming out. They put in place an official exchange rate um, that is different from the, the true exchange rate and force uh, firms to convert from local currency to foreign currency at an artificially inflated rate, um, allowing the government to essentially tax their profits uh, as on their way out the door. Um, okay. This has a lot to do with whether or not you've got an independent central bank that's controlling monetary policy. It has a lot to do with um, whether you're dealing with a large government debt or not, whether you're running a current account deficit. So there's a variety of different things that sort of put, make governments more likely to uh, deploy this particular strategy, um, you know, which can be a strategy either for uh, limiting rapid capital outflows and preventing financial crises, and it's also a, a strategy that can simply be used to, to extract wealth from foreign investors. Um, so that's where we're gonna wrap kind of the political risk discussion today, sort of some of the mechanisms uh, uh, by which uh, governments end up extracting wealth from foreign investors or through which foreign investors end up losing wealth due to uh, political circumstances, right? And the, that, those different types of political risk kind of help us understand why you don't see more capital than we do flowing from uh, rich countries uh, to poor countries, um, right? So we still, we do see a fair amount of capital making that trip and we're very interested in, in why that happens. and bringing capital into capital scarce countries is one of the ways you get investment uh, or sorry, the ways you get economic growth going, right? Developing countries have a lot of, uh, have a lot of land, they have a lot of labor, they need the capital to get that growth going. Um, but creating the conditions for that foreign investment requires limiting the risks that investors are facing. And some of the steps that governments take to limit those risks, uh, like signing a bunch of bilateral investment treaties and preferential trade agreements, also uh, restrict their own policy freedom and end up limiting their sovereignty and sometimes put them in positions where they're paying damages uh, to multinational firms for policy choices that they made. Um, so this is, I, I mean, to me at least, it's a very uh, fascinating area of, of kind of political economy research to try to understand uh, the dynamics that drive these capital flows. And I'm looking forward to uh, talking through all these issues with all of you in person.